Okay, today I'm going to give you two concepts that I think are going to be helpful to your entrepreneurial journey. The first one is the small experiment. I'm going to talk about that. And I'm also going to talk about inversion thinking and what that role can play in your venture going forward. Now, the small experiment. The small experiment is thinking about your business, not from the viewpoint of creating a giant business plan, carrying this thing out for a couple of years, and having this whole thing planned out and raising a big pile of money, and that's your end goal. The small experiment is breaking everything down into its smallest components, experimenting with that and making sure that succeeds first and building from there. It would be like saying, all right, I'm gonna go build a building when no one's ever done it before and their small experiment might be building materials, figuring those out, how you're gonna use those and where you're gonna use those, experimenting with them to see what's, what's working and what isn't before you build the big building out of the stuff. And so the small experiment gives you an opportunity to try things, see what works. If it fails, then move on because you didn't invest a lot of money in the small experiment. So it's not a big failure. It isn't failure in big bold letters. It's just failure in little tiny letters. And so it's very easy to just move on, try something else and keep going. Small experiments are a great way to build entrepreneurship skills and it's a great way to build your business. Even the stuff that we're doing right now, Middle Rock Partners is doing a series of small experiments. It's our YouTube channel. It's our Quora page. It's all of the things that we do that uh, enable us to try things out, refine them, see what works, see what doesn't work. And then when they do work, run with them and refine them and use them as a part of the bigger project, which is to build Middle Rock into a very helpful, help, very helpful organization for entrepreneurs. And so, None of that would be possible if we just said, hey, we're gonna go for the big thing and never stop to do these little things along the way and try them out and experiment with them. And if they don't work, it's not a big deal. We didn't know that our Zoom calls would work or not. We just went out there and did them. We didn't even wait until we had them all polished in. We just went ahead and said, all right, we're gonna try this and flounder around with it and just make notes, try and make it better each time and little by little we figured it out. We're doing the same thing here. This is brand new to me. This is not my format of getting in front of a camera and talking so it's uncomfortable. <laughs> it's scary. It's all of those things. But hey, you know, you might write me a few nasty notes, but other than that, there isn't a lot there isn't a lot I'm really worried about. But you know, there's there's um there's small experiments in all types of businesses. And it's a way to test your concept in little granular pieces to see what works and what doesn't. Then you bolt those things together and you start to build on that business. And that becomes a big business. So I can think of lots of ways to do it. If you happen to be in the restaurant business, it could be how you try different menu items on people and do those small experiments until you have something refined and you give it away. You do some small thing to get people to try it and give you feedback on what they think of it. And so you do these little types of things like that, little samples to just get some consumer reaction and to see how things are going. It might be testing a product with certain people who don't know you to see what their reaction is and see if they drop dead. No, just kidding. Um, just, to, just to see if it's something that, uh, that the consumers will like. Don't make the mistake of going to your friends and saying, do you think this is good? They're gonna lie. <laughs> They're gonna tell you it's good. You need to go to somebody who doesn't know it's you and you need to do these experiments in such a way that you see with their feet whether or not they're reacting to it positively or negatively. But again, and I say this more than once, don't try and be all things to all people whenever you're creating any sort of business concept. Think of who your market is and the rest of the world will follow. Duluth Trading didn't try and be clothing for everybody. They went after the work clothing market and they've been phenomenally successful in that particular area. And guess what? Other people buy their clothing too. So you want to um, be thinking about this tiny experiment as a way to advance your business and it doesn't cost you anywhere near as much money. Not only that, you can prove concept which can help you attract venture capital. It's much easier to get investors when you can prove different ideas and concept along the way rather than nothing and say, well, I need this pile of money to go big. Don't go big. Don't go for big air. Just do it little 
and do it small and experiment and refine and then grow. Don't worry about somebody copying your idea. I get that question a lot. Somebody stole my idea, somebody blah, blah, blah. Nonsense. Ideas are everywhere. It's not just the idea, it's the acting on the idea. So ideas are easy, they're cheap, they're everywhere. And it's whether or not you act on them that gives them value. And just because somebody else has the same idea doesn't mean that you can't go in and do something that's similar or identical and pursue it too. Get out there and build something. Don't give me this about, about, oh, that was my idea and therefore I can't do it. You can have more than one idea and build a business, right? Think of a restaurant. How many ideas are those? So, and they go, well, you know, I, I came up with a burger stand. Well, so did McDonald's, so did Burger King, so did everybody else. And so it's the, it, it's the execution of that idea that gives it that value, right? So that's what distinguishes a McDonald's from a Burger King. And it's what makes all of these various concepts. Look at airliners, right? So you have different airlines. They have different brands and cultures behind how that airline works. You have Southwest versus Alaska. They have two different perceived values. And so you have different stuff like that that is the same idea. So this notion of, oh, there's ideas are singular. Well, there isn't only one restaurant. There isn't only one airline. There isn't only one hotel chain. It's, you know, you have all of these different types of things. Well, the same thing happens with any idea, regardless how, how unique it is. It is you know, you, we have now these, these ultra black paints that light doesn't reflect at all. There's more than one person working on those concepts. When you have nanotechnologies, there's more than one person working on it. Yes, you might have a patent on an invention that you need to protect, that you look, put a lot of money into experimenting and getting it, and all of that's great. But unless you act on that, unless you do something with it, it doesn't have much value. There are millions of patents sitting at the patent office right now that aren't being used. They're ideas that somebody patented and they're just sitting there. So those ideas don't have much value when they're sitting there and no one's using them and the patent's about to expire. So they're paying those refiling fees or whatever they're doing. So don't get a hung up on this notion about ideas. It's the execution that's valuable. That's, it's the execution that matters. You never know, they might buy you, you might buy them. So I try to keep things as friendly as possible and don't do anything underhanded. That's just never cool. So, okay, enough about that. Now, the next thing I wanted to talk about was inversion thinking. Inversion thinking is a concept of thinking about everything in reverse. What could go wrong? What would stop you from doing this? What are the things that could get in your way? And then solving those problems as you build the business. When we started Exotics at Redmond Town Center, the weekly car gathering of exotic cars, what we did was we used inversion thinking to start the venture in the first place. How did we apply that? We went out and we talked to all of the others that failed. So we looked at all of the Saturday car shows up and down the coast and around the country and I flew around and attended a few and saw what was working and what wasn't. I talked to those who started shows and then collapsed and found out why they collapsed. After a while, when I put all of these notes into a chart, it was very obvious that the ones that failed all had certain things in common. One was that they didn't define the type of car that was gonna enter the show. They also didn't police the show in any way, and they also didn't put together a criteria of where the show should happen in the first place. So through all of that, we were able to come up with a very specific criteria we would need in order to have a successful event. We looked for that very perfect site that had all of that criteria. We met with management. We told them what our plan was, got them aboard, and the next thing we know, we started the event, and it was a huge success. We used a combination of the small experiment in order to refine that concept and bring it to what it is today. And we also used inversion thinking, which was the concept of looking at everything that could potentially go wrong and solving for that first. Inversion thinking is a wonderful way to build a business. So it's asking the what ifs, thinking about where your business is going to go, asking those what ifs ahead of time, and then solving to that long before it's a problem. I do this with clients, so when we at Middle Rock, when I have a client and they're talking about their grand vision, I start thinking about, well, what could go wrong? What are all the things that could potentially damage the business on the way there? 
and I start to think about solutions long before there are ever issues. That does a few things. One, it helps create a strategic plan for the business going forward. But the other thing that it does is it helps you define your mission because there are some things that sort of percolate to the top of things that you really have to be concerned about. So for instance, one business, it was competitive threats. I saw competitive threats creating a value added strategy and being able to offer the customer more. And I said, look, you've got to change the way you do business and start adding things that give you greater value before you go in the door. Otherwise, you're going to see a downturn in business at some future date as this takes hold. So that's a way of applying inversion thinking to look ahead and think about all of the things that could potentially go wrong and looking at competitors and competitive threats and then acting accordingly. Now, I've said this in an earlier video, when you're doing inversion thinking, think of it in terms of rings of a circle and how they get bigger. So if you're thinking about competition as one of your, your threats, you might be thinking if you're in the restaurant business as an example, because everybody knows restaurants, is that it's the, the competitor is the restaurant down the street. You're not thinking about the takeout or the delivery restaurant. That's a bigger circle. That's a bigger ring. So Sears wasn't thinking about the threat of Amazon. Its, its smaller circle of competition was things like Kmart and JCPenney's and stores like that. It wasn't even thinking about that bigger ring around them that was much further out, which was Amazon. Think again. I've said this in another video. Sears was the analog version of Amazon. If Sears had their act together at all and were thinking about that peripheral threat, that threat that was further out there, they could have taken on Amazon years ago. But no, they didn't think about that. They didn't think it was a threat. And so you have to do that as you think about your business in the form of inversion thinking. Think of the things that could go wrong and then solve those things ahead of time. When you're picking office space, well, what happens if there's a downturn in business? Can we subdivide this space? and get out of it. What can we do when we're thinking about all of these things? We had a client do a phenomenally expensive build out of an office when they didn't have the cash reserves for it. They had to borrow to do it. And I was thinking to myself, oh my God, how can you do this? But people will do that. You'll have businesses that do that where they don't think ahead about the threats that could be on the horizon. And so I've never thought highly of, of expensive office space ever. It's like you sublease, you try and find short-term leases, you try and keep it scrappy so that you have the flexibility. It's about the what ifs. What are you going to do if? It's different if you're a Facebook or a Netflix or some of these companies that are rolling in massive sums of money. You can build stuff out. You can build entire buildings and it's not a giant risk for you. But if you're a small business and you do an expensive build out, it's just flat dumb. And so I don't advocate it for, for any business anywhere. And uh, it's not something that I've ever been a fan of. And so it's, uh, I see these businesses that do it and I just think it's crazy because they aren't thinking about the what ifs. I apply that inversion thinking to every business and I'm always thinking about competitive threats what's on the competitive landscape, what you need to do to survive, how you need to stay ahead of the competition. It's why I value CES so much, the Consumer Electronics Show. I wouldn't miss CES for anything. It's 17 years now and I've gone every year. What do I look for at CES? It isn't just the great technologies that come out. I'm thinking about how those technologies impact my business and they're gonna impact my business in one way or another. I may not see it initially, but it is all happening. And so I go to CES looking for those things that are going to impact business in some way or where I need to stay ahead of my own way of doing business so that I'm not eaten up at some point by something that I just didn't think about. I think about things such as robotics and new technologies that make things easier and ways of, of, of scraping data and mining data and how those things are going to impact us. All of those things are things that matter to me in my way of doing inversion thinking. And so I think that all of that is very, very critical on this journey that you have of entrepreneurship. With that, you can apply those two things and they should serve you very well. Now, please subscribe to us. Just hit the subscribe button and write to us. Let us know some of the questions you have. We're more than happy to answer them. 
and we love we love it when you write to us and follow us on Quora under Tom on Entrepreneurship. I write there and also on our middlerock.com page as well as tomnault.com. So you can find me in both places and as well as uh, or the third place, which is Quora. So thank you very much for being here. And until next time, bye.